Almighty God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you provide for us. We are especially thankful for this church. The members of this church, we can worship you. We are thankful for this country where we can worship you in a, in a manner that we see fit. Lord, we ask that at this time, as we go into this worship service, you will bless everyone here. Particularly, I ask for a blessing upon me and my words, and the words that I say reflect what you want. But the words that they hear be what you want them to hear. Lord, please let us worship you and keep in mind that everything is about your son, Jesus, the Messiah, and that everything we do should be focused on him. You should get all honor, glory, and praise. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Draw your swords. Welcome. We're glad you're here. We're glad to be here. Talk to you about the things that God wants us to talk about. Things that he wants us to pray about. Now it is in this particular time that our world is in. It's very easy to feel dejected, alone, or just is there anybody else out there? We isolate ourselves. We take everything in. We only see it, everything from our own perspective. And that's normally true. We only see from our perspective. But when we don't get to visit with a lot of people, we don't worship with people in fellowship, then it becomes worse and worse. Feeling alone is not an unusual thing for Christian people, for God's people. I'll take you to 1 Kings 19. The prophet Elijah. And when Elijah, we're all familiar with the story. If you're not, read 17 and 18 of 1 Kings. But he had defeated 400 prophets of Baal. That's where he called on and had had them build an altar, had them do things to try to get their, their God to strike their altar into fire. And then when it was his turn, he said, well, bring in, some, bring in some water and pour all over it. And he gave a simple prayer. God struck lightning down, burned up the altar, the offering, and everything else. So and after that, those, and then he killed all 400 of them. Then they went and said, they came after Elijah, and he had to run. He ran from the city, went to Mount Carmel. Are you with me yet? We're still in 1 Kings, now we're in, in 19. And I'm going to read to you verse 10. And it's just where Elijah is there. He is feeling alone and dejected. And he said, I have been very jealous, zealous for you. I've been jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He says something very similar, just a few verses on down in 14. He is praying to God here, saying, Hey, I'm out here all by myself. He jumped down to 14 and he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because, the because of the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenants and thrown down thine altars and slain their prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. I am here by myself. Woe is me. Now, we don't like to think about a great prophet like Elijah being like that, but he was dejected. 
He was feeling like he was in it all by himself. But we're going to talk about, and we're going to go through this here in just a minute, what God had to say to Elijah in all of his despair. Jump down here to, to verse 18. And I know I'm jumping around taking one verse at a time, but I want you to read all of 19, 1 Kings 19, and you'll get the whole gist of this, of how he is feeling his way. And this is God talking to Elijah, responding to him, says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Yeah, you think you're by yourself. But there's 7,000 out there that I've got. That made Elijah feel better. But he felt like he was alone and by himself. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. We, it's, it's not wrong for us to feel like we're alone by ourselves, but we need to understand God has got this. It's hard. It's hard for us to really believe and live like God's in charge of everything. Because we like, we like to be in charge, or we like to at very least be in on the plan. So we know. have a triumphal entry, then he would get arrested, he would be beaten, and then he would be hung on a cross to suffer the most painful death there was. He knew that was the plan, and he went anyway. So that's the kind of faith we need, that's the kind of that's the kind of commitment we need to have to God and his plan. And that's probably why we don't know most of the plan most of the time. But in the weeks that were there, Christ showed us many times how we should live our life and what, should we, what we should be doing. I want to call your attention when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. Uh, turn with me in your scriptures. Well, I want you to go to Matthew. Uh, chapter 26. Now, as Christ... Let me set this up for you, and we'll go back in a little bit in a minute. Jesus was sitting there with the disciples, particularly Peter, James, and John. But in 26, oh, where do I want to be? 26, 27. Now, this is where we, a lot of times we'll use this in the communion service. And it was there, he says, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he drank, gave it to them. He said, drink ye all of it. All of it. That meant a lot more than just, here, drain this cup. There's other portions in there, but a couple chapters before, back at 22. Jesus was teaching the disciples, chapter 22. And for 
for work, work for a homework assignment here, you need to read 22, 23, 24. But Jesus was sitting there reading this. Now let's go on to chapter 23. He's teaching his disciples. Yeah. It's not highlighted. What should happen? I'm sorry. Go back to chapter 20. I'm sorry. Let's go on back to chapter 20. Let's start in about verse 18. He said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. They shall deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock, to scourge, and to crucify him, and on the third day he shall rise. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children and her daughters and her sons, worship him and desiring certain things. And he said, what will that be? And they said, grant that these my two sons may sit one on the right and one on on one hand and one on the on the other in thy kingdom. And he said, no. Jesus answered and he said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, yeah, we can do that. And he said unto them, You shall drink indeed of the cup and be baptized of the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand or on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now, think about this a minute. Where is, where is Christ right now? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Almighty. So, one of them wanted to be on the left-hand side, where, and that's where God sits. So, that's not the right answer. But the key phrase here is, are you able to drink from the cup that I'm going to drink of? I mean, he told them. Back here in, in 18 and 19, what was about to happen? I'm going to be arrested lied about, mocked, beaten, and then condemned to die. But not only is it condemned to die, I'm going to die on the cross. I will be crucified. Again, he was all right. Jesus was there going, okay, you can't drink of the cup I'm going to drink of, but I have to. This is what makes Jesus so special. But he took the cup during the Passover, he was having Passover, and his implementing communion, he said, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he said, drink ye all of it. Take my teachings. Commit it to your mind, to your heart, and and go out and do what you have to do, whether you like it or not. Remember Peter in Gethsemane. Peter was sitting there, and he was. He said, "No, I'll, I won't forsake you. I'll stay with you, no matter what." Christ told him, "Before the cock cries twice, you'll deny me thrice." No, 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 no. That won't happen. But it did. Jesus knew. Jesus knows. But he's given us all a cup to drink. Let's move on to Jesus' arrest. After the communion was implemented, came to the Passover, Jesus went through there, he implemented that. Then as they were getting ready to leave, 
Now this is, when we do communion, we only go down to the to about the 29th, where it says, "I will not drink more to the fruit of the vine." And in 30, it says, "And then when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the bought, to the, the Mount of Olives." And that's where Jesus told them, he says, all of you will be defended by me for me tonight. Because it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Uh, that is out of the book of, Isaac, of Zechariah. And that's where that prophecy comes from. So, in your spare time, look that up too. But notice when Jesus then he went out there, went to to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is this is where it becomes more and more of a Bible lesson of how Jesus acted and how he conducted himself. And we need to look at that and say, okay, though this is where we need and how we need to conduct our lives in our daily lives with the people that may or may not be our best friends. Go to uh, let's let's run over to Luke just a little. Got to get my notes there so I know where to go in Luke. Let's go to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22 is where we start with this and go through the Passover and what is all going to be going on. And he comes down to a very, we're going to read this account in the beginning in Luke 22, 33. And we're going to read this about Peter's denial Christ telling him all that. And then we're going to go just a little bit further on down to verse 38. In 22, 38, and he said to them, Lord, I am ready to... Oh, and Peter was sitting there. Simon, he was just... <clears throat> he's all to, telling him, no, I'll go with you no matter what. Then Peter says, and then God, Christ says to him, he says, he says, Peter says to Christ, he says, Lord... I'm ready to go with thee into the prison and to death. And then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou hast denied me, before thou shalt thrice deny me that thou know me. And when he said that, <coughs> and then he said to them, when I sent you out, okay, out to preach, I sent you without money, without a knapsack, sandals, and you lacked nothing. And and what did you lack? Did you lack anything? And they all looked around themselves and said, no, we, we had everything we needed. And then in verse 36, he says, then I say unto you now, he who has money, a, a purse, a money bag, take it with you. Likewise, the knapsack. Take your clothes. And he who has no sword, sell your clothes and buy one. This time when Christ was sending him out, it wasn't just go and everything will be provided for you. Now you have to actually go, you have to preach, and you have to be ready to defend yourself. For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And that's a quote from Isaiah 53. So <coughs> we won't go back there and read that. But then he said, then they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Then they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
he took all the disciples to the Mount of Olives. And then he sat there, he sat them down, and he says, pray here so you don't enter into temptation. Went over, knelt down and prayed. And in verse 42, he was sitting there praying, and one of them heard, he says, Father, if thou would be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Again, I know this is rough, and I don't want to go through it. Is there some other way you can get me through this? But if there's not, I will do as you ask. When you think about your daily life, as you walk with Christ and try to follow God, how many times do you look at this and say, yeah, I can do that? I heard a sermon one time, somebody was talking about difficult tests. This is one of them difficult tests. Text, you've got to sit there and live this. Then you're, then you're living a difficult text. Now we're going to go back. This is, keep your finger there. We're, we're likely to come back to Luke. We are going to go to John. But go to Matthew. Matthew 26. And we're going to look for the similarities and the little bit of differences Christ had gone off to, to pray and he had come back and now they were asleep and he says, wait, can't you just what, can't you pray with me for just an hour? And in 42, it's just there, and he went away again and a second time saying, oh, Father, if this cup may pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. <clears throat> Is there any other way? I really don't want to do this. So Jesus was he wasn't merrily on his way. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that because of the cross, because of the glory set before him, Christ endured the cross. Because he knew what the outcome would be afterwards. And and folks, if you know what the outcome is going to be afterwards then this is encouragement for you to not fall into the fall into the trap of, oh, I don't want to do this. So I want you to go to John. The Gospel of John. Let's see where we're at. For being synoptic gospels, they don't follow each other very, clo very closely. So we go to the same section, the rest, the betrayal of Jesus. Now remember, they took those two swords. Because Jesus says, that'd be, that'd be enough. <clears throat> now, how well do you remember the story? But we're, we're going to cover it in John. And when they come to arrest him, of course, Peter, uh, Peter, James, and John was there with him praying. And all of a sudden, hey, here they come. Here comes the crowd. Judas is there. He kisses him on the cheek. And they start to lay hold on him. Then in John chapter 18, Uh, let's, let's start there in verse 10. It says, and, and Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So apparently John knew this guy. Then Jesus said unto Peter, 
Put up your sword. Into its sheath. Put your sword up into its sheath, the cup which my Father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? The symbol of the cup as, as service. This is what Christ has to do for his service. But that is, that is the important part there. That this cup that God has given me, my Father gave me this cup. How can I not drink of it? How can I not drink it? Back to the back to the communion service. He said, to drink all of it. Now, let's flip back to Luke, try and catch this in the same in the same vein. Uh, let's see where we're at. We'll be in Luke 22. You think you got stress in your life? We'll go back just a little bit further into Luke. Yeah. Luke is where it talks here. Here, Luke 22, 44. Well, let's go up to 42. He says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nonetheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's the same thing going on. Same theme. It's all recorded. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly in his sweat was as, as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from the prayer, it was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And then he said, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. You think you got stress in your life? If you ain't sweating blood, you ain't got as much stress as the Savior had. But drop on down there again. We're talking about the arrest because this is just at the time of the arrest. Okay? Drop down to uh, uh, verse 49. It says, And when they were with about, about him saw what would follow, they said to him, Lord, shall we smite with, smite with the sword? And one of them <coughs> smite the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Okay, we know from reading in John that was Peter striking Malchus. And then Jesus said unto him, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Jesus was the perfect example. So what does the perfect example tell you about the way you should live when people are less than your best friends. Peter, being a friend, thought he was doing what needed to be done to defend the Messiah. Cut off the guy's ear. Jesus says, stop that. John, we hear he put it, put your sheep, put the sword back in your seat. He reaches down, picks up the ear, and puts it back on the high priest's servant's head, Malchus, and healed him. I want to go back to Matthew. Did you keep your thing finger there? Because we're going to go back to Matthew. We're going to we're going to look at this again, the same thing. And now we're going to start in, in verse fifty-one in Matthew twenty-six fifty-one. And behold, one of them which was for Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that must be that it must be? 
All right, let's go back and be in the shoes of Peter for a second here. People are coming to arrest Christ. He knows that. He's been told. Jesus has already told him. And here they come. It's a mob. It's an angry mob. Pulls out his sword, cuts off the right ear of Malchus. And Jesus stops him. He says, put it away. Everything that must be fulfilled has to be done this way. Peter, even though you think you're doing the right thing, you may not be in tune with the will of God. Jesus was. He didn't necessarily like everything he was going to have to do, and he was asking for another way. The cup the Father has given for me, how can I not drink it? Brothers and sisters, when you go through trying times, Brother Dale, your leg hurts, and I know that to be a fact. But you have to drink the cup that's in front of you. God has given us things to do, and we must do them. Well, we don't have to. I guess Jesus always had to the option of not doing it. But he never exercised that option. He never called for the 12 legions of angels. And, and we probably would. Had I been in Jesus' shoes, Malchus, Malchus probably would have never got that ear back. Now, I hope Jesus don't think ugly of me for being that way, but he knows how I am. That's why it wouldn't be asked of me. But I would like to think and pray that whatever he does ask of me, I am willing to do. You have to look at that. You have to pray every day. And you pray to drink the cup that God has put before you because that's what he needs and expects from the servants of the Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Heavenly Father, we hold up to you our hero, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Messiah, who fulfills your plans and who will judge us. And we beg that he judge us leniently, that we may enter into your grace the kingdom of heaven where you are sovereign and you are definitely in charge we yield to your glory we yield to your power and to your sovereignty bless us each and every one with all honor glory and praise being yours we ask in the name of our hero Jesus amen